Now, those of you that are down here, you walk out of here with peace today. I don't care what enemy somebody says you're facing. I, the name may sound daunting. There's some names that sound daunting. They're daunting because man has no real solution to them. But I want you to understand that you're in a kingdom of resurrection life. There's a door open, a room open beyond what man without God knows about. There's another room open for the children of God, and that's resurrection power. And so you believe for that, and you hold on to that, and then you just love the Lord because I'm telling you, He's going to whisper some things in your ear, into your spirit, that are, are going to mean more to you than anything you've ever heard in your life more than anything you've ever heard in your life. So Father, I thank you for what you've done today. We give you glory. Our lips shall magnify your holy name. And when the world says you have cause to shut up, we'll say we shout and rejoice. Amen. Hallelujah. And we give you the praise, Lord, in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Anybody down here give your life to the Lord for the first time today? This was your real first time to submit to the Lord. Anybody? Just lift your hand. It's okay. Right there. Anybody else? All right. Mario, why don't you introduce yourself to him, talk to him a little bit, you know? All right. God bless you guys. I'm expecting to hear powerful things out of what God's done in your life. And it's so good to see all of you out there this morning. You may be seated if you'd like. You know, I, got, I, I took encouragement because Benjamin Liberlon, I was praying and talking, and he was amening me a minute ago, and I just took courage from that. I said, hallelujah. Boy, it's good to see all of you on this weekend before Thanksgiving. I know a lot of people have already vacated. I really think that, you know, pressure's been so bad on people in this world nowadays and problems, a lot of people are vacating. You know what I mean? I mean, they're, they're saying, hey, man, last year we took three days off. This year, let's take a whole week. You know, let's just get out of town. But I'm praying that everybody that's already gone will run straight into Jesus, just right into him, man, and right into his lordship and his power and his anointing. And it's great to be here with you today. Great to be here with you today. I'd rather be here with you than be in jail. I'd rather be here with you than be at a, at a football game or anything else, you know, I had made a promise to my grandkids uh, that I would take them to a football game, a, a college football game before the season was over. Well, when I started looking at my calendar and their calendar, I was like, oh boy. But I wanted to be a man of my word. So yesterday I took them uh, down to Waco and we sat out there and watched the TCU Baylor game. And, and it was cold. Everybody say it was cold. As a matter of fact, when we were walking to our car, it was sleeting. You know, sleet was coming down. But we had a great time. How many of you saw that yesterday? That was pretty amazing at the end. My grandson said, my grandson said we always go to games and our team that we root for loses every time. Well, I was wondering in the last 15 seconds, I was wondering, I thought, I don't know if everybody can get off the field and everybody get on the field and get set in time for this to happen, but, but, it, but it did. TCU, last second, last second. Um, but you know, it was, it was a great day. We were down there. I was with them almost most of the day, all day, actually. They came back with me and we had a great time and it, it was just really really good and I, it's good to be with you guys this morning how many of you are looking forward to thanksgiving i like that i don't like christmas eclipsing thanksgiving i love christmas but i like thanksgiving it's one of those pure motive holidays i like to call you know instead of hey we're, we're thinking about what we can buy what we can get what we got to do what we got to do what we got to do I like Thanksgiving. I mean, I know we cook meals and everything, but, but it's just good to come together. And then what we're doing is lifting our hands and saying, Father, thank you. I give you praise. Even thank you for Uncle Joe. You know, God, thank you. 
You know, he never does a thing, but always shows up at, to eat, you know, but praise God, you know, it's got to, you know, you're, you're going to get through to Uncle Joe one of these days. Hallelujah. And I am not going to let Uncle Joe ruin my Thanksgiving. Hallelujah. Uncle Joe, would you like a second heppin? That'd be fine if you would. Just take one. And just God bless him. Hallelujah. So it's great to be with you guys. How many of y'all have an Uncle Joe you're going to see this week? Anybody? He's not called Joe. I understand that. But you got one you're going to be with. You know, if they start all that gloom and despair stuff, say, let's just stop and pray for a minute. I tell you what, it'll stop all that stuff. You know what I mean? Say, oh, wait a minute. I tell you what, let's just stop and give thanks for a minute. Everybody bow your head. Don't even ask them if they want to. Just start it. You understand what? Just start it. Just say, everybody bow your head. We're going to pray. <laughs> Don't even ask them permission. Just do it. Lord, thank you that we live in a place where we can still come to church and not be arrested yet. Where we can still call out on your name. We thank you for it, Father. Lord, I thank you that you're good to us. And even Uncle Joe, he's not in jail today, Lord. He's free. Start saying all the good things about Joe, you know, over him. Yo, you're free today. You're free. All right, we'll get off Joe. All right. Man, it's good to be with you. Um, let's take some time to end our worship time with, with giving. Yo, whoa, whoa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Now, let me, let me just tell you something before we do this. Uh, you, I might be dangerous today because I'm not watching the clock. You understand? I've been in Cuba. You know, I've been in Cuba, and the clock is relative there. But, you know, this year, this has been a year where a lot of people have seen 10% of their income just disappear, disappear in costs. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, it didn't just go out of their bank account. It was still there, but it disappeared in costs. And, and, and you know, that's, that's always a challenging time. And some people look at that and they go, well, there goes my tithe. You know, it just went away. Hey, man, no, it didn't go away. You dig deeper and you get the tithe out of there. And, and, and you know, that's what you do. I, I say, man, the, the stuff I honor God with is not going to disappear on me. Hallelujah. And I know it can be tough, but, but you know, God's a tough God. He can do it. And, it. and this year, the church, you know, we continue, we tithe on everything that you guys give into other ministries. We tithe it into other ministries. And this year, above that, because of your generosity and your faithfulness to the Lord, because of good stewardship on behalf of your staff, really good stewardship. And primarily because of the goodness of God, we were able to give like $155,000 above what we would normally give this year. In a year, in a year where a lot, we, you know, everybody said we should be cutting back, should be cutting back. And we were able to do that. And you, we were able to, to do some big projects in Africa, a couple of big ones that I saw when we were there, that, uh, that uh, Mario saw when he was there. We were able to fix one of the, the schools in the slum that was falling down. We were able to uh, put a whole new toilet and bathroom and plumbing system in the boys' home. We were able to, in India, we were able to build a missionary house there. You built it this year so that Raj and Colleen will have a place for teams as well as they can live in it when teams aren't there and get off the campus because the government was using them living on campus as a, an avenue of persecution to them. You are also able to give a huge chunk toward the construction of a Christian school there, which is uh, big because kids have to go to Hindu school if they don't go to Christian school. Let's see, you guys were able to give money toward Cuba. You were able to do some things in Cuba. I went and preached in Cuba. I don't want to steal Cuba because I'm going to do that in a minute. But I went and preached in Cuba at a church that was brand new. There was no toilet there. 
So, you know, we drove, 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 and you know, when old people drive, 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 they have to go to the toilet. You understand what I'm saying? When you, when you get out, I mean, that, that's a fact of life. And so we were supposed to preach and minister, and I said, where's the restroom? They said, sorry, there is not one. There's a grove of banana trees right over there. So me and Eric Pressgrove went into banana trees, and God did some great things there, and man, I heard the testimonies that were there. No, not there, not there, in the church, in the church. Watch your mind there, brother, no. In, in the church is what I'm talking about. And God did some great things in that service, and, and the, I heard testimonies in there that were unbelievable. They're right in the middle of a witch, a big witchcraft thing. And man, people were getting saved and everything. And, and uh, so you said, well, sorry, we didn't have a bathroom. We said, well, how much will it take to build a bathroom? And they told us, and Eric and I just dug down into our pockets and some of the money you guys had given, and we paid. So they got a brand new bathroom that's going to be made in that church. And uh, so next time we go, there will be no banana forest. Hallelujah. That's good. And uh, yeah, and Cuba, and then I'm not, and then on top of that, you sent some money to Cuba to really help. And then Pregnancy Help Center, you guys did a lot of stuff there this year. And so just want to say thank you. And that doesn't count the food, the meals, everything that y'all did over and above. Care Center, Union Gospel. None of that, that, none of that comes out of the tithe. All of that support comes out of, out of just our regular income, care center ministries, rescuing people. Any support you did for Union Gospel, providing meals for the people. You provided meals for, for families at Leonard Middle School. You participated and provided 300 meals over at, what's that place called? Clayton Youth. You provided meals for people here in the congregation. I just want to say it's Thanksgiving. You know what I want to say to you? I want to say thank you. Because that's what it's all about. And, man, to God be the glory for everything that he has done. Hallelujah to his holy name. Now today's Mission Sunday and Rhonda's going to hold the globe. He's got the whole world. In his hands, he's got the whole world. In his hands, he's got Joe Biden. In his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands. Okay, when you're talking about the world, is there anything in the world that he doesn't have in his hands? No. So you can relax today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so very much for everything that you're doing. Lord, we just give you praise and honor and glory. Thank you for the way you have been able to use Capstone this year to do things around the world for orphans and for, for pastors and for those that are struggling. God, I just pray that you'll take these gifts that we're giving today, bless them, break them, and multiply them. And we give you the glory, Father, in Jesus' name. And I'm praying for an outpouring upon the givers in the name of Jesus for the glory of God. Everybody said amen. God bless you as you give. God sent his son. They call him Jesus. He came to love. Heal and forgive. He bled and died.
Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God is good. Now, before we jump into the Word, I just want to tell you this. Don't forget that today you can pick up your wristbands for the gobbler. And if you're bringing food Tuesday night, and don't come if you're not bringing any food. You know, no, I'm just... <laughs> don't be an Uncle Joe. Look at your neighbor and say, don't be an Uncle Joe. <laughs> But bring it in disposable dishes so you can, so your pastor won't be in traction the rest of the week from washing dishes and, you know, and everything. So don't bring any crock pots. Just bring it. We'll heat it up. All right. Don't worry about it. But pick up your wristbands today after church, uh, and, uh, or you can pick them up during the week. But I'm only going to be in the office Monday and Tuesday. So, you know, if that's, that's when you can come. And uh, then I'm, I've got to go visit people for Thanksgiving. And unfortunately, I've had a broken family, so there's a lot of people to visit. You know, I've got dad, I've got mom, I've got my brother. I've, so we're going to be, everybody else understands, we're going to be running around doing a lot of visiting for Thanksgiving. And, and I'm looking forward to it. Praise the Lord. You know, um, there's several different kind of words that can be given in a church service. Uh, there's definitely an instructional word. An instructional word can be given. We, a lot of instructional words come, you know, here at Capstone. An instructional word is where we look at the Bible, we learn new things, we, we learn how to, the scriptures, we learn how to implement them into our lives, we learn what the scripture says about our lives and about us. There's also inspirational words. You know, there's a time where, you just come, and, and you know, the, the Lord's just encouraging you. He's imparting strength into you. He's giving you uh, uh, a confirmation on something you've already been hearing. And then there's a prophetic word. And the word today that I'm going to give you falls more into that category. In, in the wake of the elections that just happened, I want to share something with you that God's been speaking to me. I also want to share with you a little bit about what he's been telling me about Capstone Church, okay? So today I'm calling this word the red wave. But before we get into this, uh, I want to thank you for allowing me to go to Cuba, all right? Thank you for allowing me to go. I was there one week. It was hot. I was thankful to get off the plane in 40-degree temperatures, I was sick of that heat, but God did some really good things and brought some things to fruition that, we had, that had been prophesied a few visits ago. I was able to hook back up with a, a young man um, named David there in Cuba. He, he is a college professor. Uh, he teaches English to Cuban students in university. He's a wonderful guy. He comes from a lineage of righteousness, a great man. His wife is a doctor. She is a physician that practices in Cuba. And uh, I was really honored to be able to hook back with, up with David. He, he interpreted for us uh, some during the trip. So he traveled with us, and we, we went and one night, we woke up at breakfast one morning. I mean, matter of fact, well, let me go back. We had been with David before on previous trips. And there's a prophetic word that had come forth over David, said, David, you're called into the ministry. And David had been running from that. He didn't want that because his dad had been a minister. And he ran from that. He said, no, I've seen what happens. I don't want to do that. Well, one morning, we were staying in a, a, a VRBO in uh, Cuba. You know, they've got them too. And we were staying there, and we woke up for breakfast one morning, and David said, I need to share something with you guys. And I said, okay. And he said, I woke up this morning to pray, and he said, the Lord told me I'm going to be talking, and you're going to be listening. He said, that's how the Lord opened everything up. He said, okay, Lord. He's, just, he's a guy that loves the Lord. He really does. And the Lord spoke to him and said, I'm calling you into the ministry, David. And... So David, when, when we got to breakfast, the Lord, David looked at us and he said, this is all what God told me. And he said, my pastor has left the island to go to the United States. I'm going to tell you what's happening in Cuba. 
People are fleeing that island in droves. They went through, they've been through the communistic, socialistic regime. They uh, went through the pandemic, which nearly killed them all. Okay? They now, uh, they are, have been going through the post-pandemic world, uh, and they are struggling. The Cuban government just decided that they were going to pass a law where they have ultimate authority over the children in Cuba that a child can decide whether he wants to stay in his home or not stay in his home as young as five years old, where kids can get married at 14 without their parents being able to, to have any consent on that. And so parents are leaving the island with their children. Pastors are leaving the island and flooding off of the island because of the pressure that's coming to them from the LGBTQ part of the government, uh, they're, they're just fleeing. As a matter of fact, we were on the east end of the island in, a, in a, the East Texas Baptist. We were ministering in Baptist churches primarily. And the East Texas Baptist Association down there on the east end of the island where there's not as many people, down on the east end of the island there were 26 pastoral openings. 26. The seminary does not have enough people in any shape, form, or fashion to promote pastors into these. There are churches everywhere with pastoral openings. How many of you feel like you're called to be a pastor? Go to Cuba. Well, you better be sure that's God, but that's tough, man. But I, I talked to pastors that were leaving. Well, we're leaving. We're going to America. We're going to America. We're leaving. We've already got our visas. We're leaving next year. People are fleeing the island. Their population is decreasing. If you've seen anything on the news recently, the second highest nationality group that is coming into the United States across the border right now behind people from Mexico is Cuba. They're the second highest group that's coming into America. Many of them are coming in uh, legally, and a lot of them are flying over to Nicaragua, and then they're coming up, they're coming up that way. Good news is a lot of strong believers are coming into the U.S. That's the good news. A lot of powerful believers. There's going to be a lot of Spanish-speaking pastors that are going to come in. So I, you know what that tells me? There's going to be a move among the Spanish-speaking people here in the United States because there are a lot of pastors that are coming. But I was touched by the pastors we talked to that said, God's called me to stay no matter what. I'm called to this nation. That touched me. Touch my heart. Now, you remember my friend David, the college professor with a wife that is a doctor. I wanna, we, we pulled up to drop, drop David off at his home. I want to show you a picture of David's home today. That's David's house. Doctor, college professor. That's all they can afford, okay? David, as a matter of fact, when he's not working, when his classes are over, he got an electric bike with a three-seat wooden seat on the back, and he ferries people places for, to make extra money. That's David. That's, that's his home. David, the government pays David $57 a month to be a college professor, the government pays his wife about $60 a month to be a doctor. 30 eggs in Cuba is $15. Yeah. So, people are struggling. The government gives you a card and, and you can go once a month to buy food from the government at a reasonable price. Well, the problem is, is the government doesn't have any food. So you stand in line for four hours, five hours to get a, a little package of chicken and a bottle of, of oil. Then they say, see you in 21 days. So the Cubans are going into the marketplace to find their food at elevated prices, $15 for 30 eggs, okay? Trying to make that money that they have stretch to feed their family. It is a day-by-day survival lifestyle for the Cuban people. 
Oh, except for the government officials. Did I say that? The government officials live in mansions. The government officials drive around in, in Mercedes and BMWs and all of that. Other, and I'm not saying anything about any of those cars. But the government officials are doing great. And they get beef. Now, the average Cuban person doesn't get any beef. It's illegal to eat it because they decided they're going to sell the beef. Oh, but the politicians get the beef and the, the, the military get the beef. If you raise cattle with a contract with the government to sell them your cattle, if you kill one of those cattle for your family, it's a 20-year prison sentence. I saw people that were held in jail with no charges filed for, for making too much money in, the Cuban, in, in Cuba. Saw a guy was in prison two years making too much money. They didn't like the size of his house, and they watched his business and thought there was too much business coming in and out of there. Prisoned him for two years, no charges filed. Finally, they let him go for God knows what reason. They said, you've got a one-way ticket off the island. Go home. We're watching you. Go home. Sell all your businesses. Sell everything you've got and be out of here by this date. Be off the island by this date. So anybody who thinks that socialism is a great idea, I'm not a real politic person, although I'm going to talk a little bit about it today, just a little. It's not a good idea. But, oh, I forgot. I forgot. We're Americans. We're way smarter than anyone else. We won't fall to the pitfalls that everyone else fell to. That's our problem. We're arrogant. We think we're different. And that we're immune to the, to the deceptions that, that come with that. Say, so, well, well, you just have, a de you have democracy. You vote your leaders. They have democracy in Cuba. They vote for leaders. Problem is the government picks the leaders that run. Anybody that will toe the line. There's David. And this guy's going into the ministry. He's going to leave behind what he did have, and he's going to go into the ministry. And I'm going to tell you what, those Cuban people, they love you guys. I go around, they love Americans. And they look at you as being a hope, a beacon of hope for them. And yeah, I don't agree with people coming into our country illegally. I, I, I think that's wrong. But when you go down there and you see that the, what the government's trying to do with their children and what... What, what the challenges that they face on a day-by-day -day basis, I can't blame them for trying to get out of there. I'm not advocating a position uh, in governmentally or, or legislatively. You need to come into a government legally. you got to come to a country legally. And most of the pastors that I saw were doing that. They were saying, we, we are convicted by the Holy Spirit, by the Word of God. We're not going to go and try to cross the border illegally. We're going to go in legally. So uh, I just wanted to give you an update. The people down there are suffering. And you guys gave a good-sized gift into, into the ministry in Cuba. And so I just want to say thank you for that. Really, really, really appreciate what you've done. Now, Acts chapter 3. We're going to start at Acts 3 this morning. We're going to read verses 1 through 10, then we're going to jump to Acts chapter 4. You ready? I got to hurry because I took up a bunch of my time. Acts chapter 3. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. That's what? 3 o'clock. Okay. 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And a certain lame man from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. What's alms? They asked him for money. That's what they were asking for. Can you give us some money? Now, this guy was an older man. It hadn't been that long since Jesus had ascended into heaven. There, the likelihood that Jesus passed this man many times and this man never was healed is high. I mean, I'm not, I'm just saying, 
We know Jesus went and, out, went and out of the beautiful gate. We know if this man was laid there daily, then Jesus passed him. You say, why didn't Jesus heal him? Because that was delegated to some of his children. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. Why would John say that? I think, John, I think, why would Peter say that? I think Peter's trying to get, listening to the Holy Spirit's what I think. I think Peter said, look at me. Peter's listening. And so he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have I can give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand. So get the, you get the gist of what's going on here. The guy just didn't jump up and start walking. Peter said, take my hand. Okay, and stand. And so they reached out and they took his hand and they lifted him up. And after they lifted him up, immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, the man, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened. Well, if you read on in the story, what we know happened is Peter and John began to preach about Jesus. And the leaders in the temple didn't like that. And so they sent the temple police, right? And they brought these two dudes in. And they began to, to investigate them. They began to do an, an inquiry of them. Who are you and what are you doing and why are you doing all of this? And after this investigation took place, we're going to go to Acts chapter 4, verse 13 through 18 and see. And see. It says, now when they saw, and those, these are the investigators, these are the people that are doing the inquiry, the inquisition. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were educated, uneducated, and untrained men. They marveled. And then they realized that they had been with Jesus. Oh, man, I can't even read that without something just coming all over me. What is it about these guys? They're, un they're idiots. They're uneducated. They're not like us. They have no positions of influence. They have no seminary training. What has happened here? What, wh who are these guys? Oh, they've been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go out aside out of the council, they convert them, conferred among themselves saying, what are we going to do to these guys? For indeed, a notable miracle has been done through them, and it's evident to everyone in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. Everybody say undeniable ev evidence. <laughs> but so that it spreads no further. Now, this is the spirit that you guys are encountering in your world today. It doesn't matter what God does. They just want it stopped. Doesn't matter what kind of evidence he shows and I'm not talking about everybody. There are some people that will be saved. But I'm talking about those in charge. It doesn't matter what God does. We just want it stopped. And so they severely threatened them that from, from now on they speak to no man in this name. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor to teach in the name of of Jesus. I want to go through some history for a few moments, the history of the church, and let's, then let's come up to the present, all right? In the 1960s, Christianity went through a revolution. As a matter of fact, some scholars say it was the biggest revolution in Christianity in 500 years. The rejection by young people in our country, our, our, our young people Woke up, I mean, they just developed this rejection in them of societal norms. And they, they went in a search of something new, something real. And that search by the young people actually caused some changes in the church of Jesus Christ. A charismatic renewal began to sweep 
through the church, people in search of something that was tangible and real began what became known as the Jesus movement. Even the Catholic church was touched by this move of the Spirit. It, it, it was even happening in sincere believers. It was happening in any church that was really sincerely seeking God. And many young people who were fleeing materialism and looking for meaning in life found life in Jesus Christ. Many did. Worship music began to change during that period of time. That was the time when worship music began to change. It began to morph. And evangelism grew as these new creations in Christ, these young people reached into the darkness for their friends. As a matter of fact, one of the most famous slogans during that period of time was what? Anybody remember? Yeah, or back a little further. One way. One way. That was one of the most famous slogans during that. What did that mean? One way, Jesus. He's the one way. He's the one way, the only way. Now, the interesting thing is while this Jesus movement happened among our young people, national interest in religion among, uh, among most of the country was actually declining. And it continued to do so until into the 70s. And the converts in the Jesus movement, they began to marry, they began to have children of their own, and they began to incorporate into American society. But I think the memory of what had happened to them during the 60s stayed with them. There was something that stirred in them even though the fires of that movement began to cool. In the 1980s, a new wind kind of swept through the church. I'm not saying it swept through the nation, but it swept through the church again. And I think some of this was due to the grown-up Jesus movement people who were again crying out for something that they had seen in their youth. And a prayer movement began to sweep through the church in the 1980s. I was saved during that period of time. And people in churches all over the all over the world began to hunger for more. They said, we want more than just what we've experienced. And that desire for more caused a shuffling. Many people left their churches. They went into churches that were really seeking more. Several churches grew very large during that period of time. That was the advent of the mega church during that period of time. And, and people were seeking and they were praying. And there was renewed teaching about seeking God and praying Jesus' priorities in the nation. While that was going on, our culture was still mostly hedonistic and falling away from God. If they were talking about God, they were primarily giving lip service. But the emphasis on the kingdom of God, the renewed interest in the Lord's prayer and how the Lord taught us to pray, caused the church to realize they couldn't just pray for something without getting involved in it. So the church began to get involved in politics to bring change. And the birth of out of the moral majority in the 70s, which was really a joke around the, around the country primarily, I don't mean anything about the moral majority. People kind of laughed about that. But in the 80s, that gave birth to the religious right. And the religious right began to, to rise as a, as a power block in the United States. With a, with a certain emphasis on seeing the kingdom of God come to pass and the, and the things of God happen. And politicians who were looking for voting blocks of support recognized this. They recognized this shift in national interest and they began to reach out to those who were praying and those who were politically active believers and they began to reach out to them to, to align with them. The problem was, and I was a part of this movement, so I can tell you by experience what was going on. The problem was, is we, as the church of Jesus Christ, became enamored by our apparent influence. Politicians and pastors lined up, stood by side by side to take pictures together, to show their solidarity or to prove their solidarity or their apparent solidarity with one another and the church took its responsibility to pray for government and be involved and that's good everybody say that's good that's good 
You can't pray for the lost and no go out and win the lost. You can't pray for God's kingdom to come and not go out and do things to see that happen. I'm not criticizing that. But soon we began to look to politics to bring change in our nation. The church began to look past the church and look to politics to bring change. And we look to politics to stop crime. We look to politics to end racism. We look to politics to stop poverty and to begin to legislate morality. And this attempt at national revival through political action has kept going for many years. And all the while that that's going on, our children and grandchildren are becoming more distant from God. And there was a a group of people began to be raised up in age and they began to get involved in politics who did, who'd had no affinity for the religious right. As a matter of fact, they, they began to think that maybe they were the problem instead of the solution. And many of those people began to take places of authority themselves and they began to propose laws that were unbiblical and ungodly. And in the midst of all of this, The church and many, many people across the land were alarmed and frustrated and angry. And something really curious happened. A man with no political connections was elected president in 2016. And like a modern day Jehu, and if you don't know your Old Testament, you'll just have to go back and look. But like a modern day Jehu, this wild man stepped into society and he began to attack everything that he believed moved against the restoration of a politically of America to its roots. Many people moaned at his crass nature. I was one of them. Many cheered his policies and many said, hey, finally, our prayers have been answered and our faith in the system has been rewarded. And I'm not here to say anything about Donald Trump. Okay, one way or another. But I'm going to tell you, the Lord did use that man for one thing. No matter what you think about him, the Lord used him for one thing. And let me tell you what the Lord used him for. And before he was elected, the Lord told me he was going to do this. Not Donald, but he was going to do it. The Lord was going to do it. The Lord used that man to do something amazing. He used him as a tool to reveal where everybody really stood. He used him as a tool to reveal what was hidden in darkness. As a matter of fact, as a believer in the past, I had supported some political candidates that I thought were were lined up with biblical values, and the rise of Donald Trump revealed those people as hypocrites. And I was like, oh, wow, I can't believe this. People that I've supported, people that I've voted for, And I'm not going to name any names, although I could. Disappointment. Well, the elections of 2020 and 2022 had a message for the church in it. And this is what I really want to focus on today. While it's good to be involved politically, your faith in change through politics is misplaced. The human heart can't be changed through legislation. Your Bible tells you so. Remember the days of the great reformer Josiah in the Old Testament? It was in the days of Josiah's children that Israel was judged and carried away because of their sin. Because in the days of Josiah, all the changes were were merely political. They didn't go into the human heart. And this expected red wave that was talked about in 2022 that didn't truly materialize, it did a little bit, but didn't really materialize. Well, maybe there's several reasons for that, and I think there are. But primarily, I'm going to tell you the church's reason in this, our fault in this, the church. Shallow measures produce shallow changes. Shallow measures produce shallow change. And I'm going to tell you, not only do shallow measures produce shallow change, shallow measures produce shallow people. It does. That's the outcome that you get when you are not really focused on the gospel 
as the impetus to change the dead to, and bring them to life. We just need to get our country to the place where all the right biblical decisions are made at the legislative level. Brothers and sisters, we're past that. We are way past that, brothers and sisters. Half of this nation don't know God, don't want God. Well, I, maybe a third, okay? The rest that are in the middle don't really have any affinity for God. They just have certain positions on certain things. And if we don't reach their hearts, America's on a ticker, a ticker to its demise. And the change, while political involvement is important, the change that we are hoping for, we better get out of our illusions to think that politics is the answer because it's not. It is not. There's a coming red wave, brothers and sisters, but it's not political. It's the red wave called the blood of Jesus. That's what's coming. And it, it's the only thing. Now, once again, I'm talking to believers. Talking to believers. If we put as much time into fasting and praying as we do and watching Fox News and other things like that, we could probably see more change. I mean, it's time. We got to go back to God's ways of doing things. We are in desperate straits in this land, and people are dying every day, and it's becoming like the old west out there. You know, I mean, just this last month, and I don't care what any political party says, they're not going to stop that. That's only going to stop through heart change. Just this past month, how many of our college students' lives have been snuffed out? Because of what's going on in the heart of people. I wouldn't blame. Next thing you know, college campuses are going to start becoming ghost towns. People are going to start pulling their kids out of college. They're going to say, I'm not sending my kid there. It's liable to get killed. The church has got to return to being with Jesus as our mission. These ignorant, unlearned people here, something's going on through them. It's powerful. What's the difference between them? What, what is different about them? Oh, they've been with Jesus. Using culture to try to change culture is idiotic. It's as idiotic as trying to cast out devils using the devil. The church has got to return to its mission of presentation of a radical Jesus. Or Jesus' words to the Pharisees is going to come true about us in Matthew 23, 15. What does it say? Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You travel land and sea to win one proselyte. And when he's won, you make him twice as much of a son of hell as yourselves. I think of all of the time and effort, and I'm not saying we need to change everything, but I think of all of the time and effort we put in to try to attract hard-hearted people into the church. If we put that time into fasting and prayer, I wonder what would happen. Well, everything's got to be just right to attract them. You, you know, and I'm like, man, you know, I went down to Cuba and the church was full of young people. And maybe what's going to cause a young people revival is the government go crazy here. Maybe that's what it's going to take. You know, we can't dumb down the power and expect to change people. Okay, we can't dumb down power and expect to change people. Jesus taught kingdom realities, and many people walked away because of them. Remember one day he lost almost his entire congregation when they said, this teaching is too hard. Who can understand it? It's too difficult. Who can understand it? Jesus talked to his disciples all the time. Half the time they didn't really understand what he was saying. But when their eyes were upon him, one thing became apparent to them. 
are you going to go away too? Jesus said one day, and he, they said, where are we going to go? You're the one that has the words to eternal life. That's the revelation we need into this society right here. That's, the, that's the what we need. And I've been praying about Capstone. Lord, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? What do we do to reach this world? What do we do? And man, Pastor Paul and, and uh, Stephanie and a lot of other people, and we, we've all talked about some things, and we've come up with some great outreaches to families for next year. Great outreaches to families. But one of the things the Lord told me is he said, Parky, he said, don't change anything as far as worship and, and the word. He said, because if you do, here's what you'll do. You'll end up spending all your time trying to convince people not to sin. That's what you'll do. You'll spend all your time trying to convince people don't sin. Rather than seeing real change, getting people really empowered, really full of the Holy Spirit, and then become disciples of the Lord. Just tell him. Just saying, as they used to say. If we're going to see this world changed, it's going to take Jesus and everything that Jesus is. Everything. Everybody say everything that he is. Everything that he is. Everything that he is. If we just give them part of who he is, they'll just be part people. It's what they'll be. And our message is, will win those that are really seeking. It will offend those with worldly sensibilities. And it will anger those who want religion that's acceptable to society. And the difference in Peter and John was being with Jesus. And that's what I'm calling you guys back to. Be people of the presence of God. And what I mean by that is I'm not calling you to sit in a worship service for 62 hours. Our young people, that's kind of where they are right now. A lot of our young people, they're coming out of the world. They, all, they, they're just the presence, just the presence. Just, I'm calling you into discipleship. Become disciples of the Lord. Disciples are willing to worship and praise and pray and pray and pray. And then when their master gets up to encounter the real world, they're willing to follow him in that encounter. And when they are seen in that real world, people can see a stark difference between them, their agenda, and what kingdom they're serving. Amen. Now, it's not going to be popular. Just like John and, and Peter experienced experienced obstacles, then we are too. And if we're more concerned about ourselves than we are about Jesus, we will shrink back and fade into the background and become powerless. And our song that we will sing is, is this one. Hold a fort, for I am coming. I'm just barely hanging on. I've been backed into a corner. Jesus, don't be long. What type of disciples is it going to take to change this world nowadays? Oh. What type? Oh. Devil's got a major foothold. Now, he's not more powerful than God, Amen. but he's got a big foothold. He took the foothold in schools. He took the foothold in universities. He took the foothold now in politics. He's taken the foothold in media. And he's trying to get a foothold in the church. Because I'll tell you, the next thing is coming. Next thing that's going to come one of these days is the church and politics are going to join forces against the true disciples of God. 
going to happen. Someday. It's what happened in Jesus' day. All right. So, what's the solution? They can't deny the reality of Christ within you. No matter what they try to do. And the reality of Christ within you is what's going to speak into this society and get the attention of those who are ripe for harvest. Because they're going to be like Parkey was in the 80s. Parkey didn't care what was going on in the church of Jesus Christ. I didn't even look to the church of Jesus Christ to be a potential solution to my problems. I wasn't looking at that at all. And guess what? Most of our people in, the, in our country now, most of our young people aren't either. They've been indoctrinated. There's no answers in the church of Jesus. You don't need to go there. And unfortunately, a lot of times, maybe they're right. But I'm going to tell you something. It's time for us to seek God at a different level than what we've been seeking Him. It's time to seek the Lord. And it's time to trust something that God puts on you that you can't create. That's an endowment from heaven. That when people get around it and it begins to produce the outcomes of the kingdom, people, it stands out. So those of you whose, whose goal is to not stand out anymore, you're going to fall away. You're going to get back down because the enemy is serious about the destruction. How serious are we about the resurrection life of Christ? All right, I'm about done. Vote. Run for office if the Lord tells you to. I'll vote for you. But I never have and never will put my faith in politics to change this nation. And I, as flawed as they were, I don't think that's really what our founding fathers thought either. John Adams said one time, he said, our Constitution can only work in the presence of a moral, religious people. If our people move away from religion and morality, and what they, those are the words they used in those days for a relationship with Jesus. If our people move away from religion and morality... Our Constitution is worthless. It's worthless. And so, brothers and sisters, we're going to do some radical reaching this coming year. We're going to do some praying. We're going to do some seeking God. Instead of buffeting our bodies all the time, we'll do a little fasting, praying. Some of us, it wouldn't hurt us especially me. Okay, so pastor, I can't fast for medical reasons. Well, fast that idiot box, whatever. Fast the television. Fast something. Anything that'll take you more into the presence of the Lord. Just say, you know, instead of doing all that, I'll spend time in the word of God and in, in prayer. And then let's just freshly fall in love with Jesus again. And as we do, we will become real agents of change. Because something's going to have to stick out about us. Because the society's not even looking at us as a viable option right now. So we're not getting their attention. Something's going to have to stick out. You understand? All right, let's pray. Father, we give you the praise, the glory, the honor, the thanks. We honor you. We thank you. Lord, I...
Lord, when I go to, I went to Cuba and what you showed me is there's a country there that's just a little bit further down the road than we are. Politically. Lord, I see that nothing's, one of the things you showed me about those Cuban people, they have zero hope. There's no political hope. The only hope they have is in Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That's it. Father, that's really all we have. We can't legislate the change of people's hearts. Lord, even though we cheered the overturn of Roe versus Wade, and I think that was you that did that. And I'm grateful for that because that had to stop. But even though we, over, we cheered the overturn of that, Lord, statistics show that most people are still in favor of abortion. Now, I don't know if those statistics are real or not, but God, we got to see heart change in people's lives, Lord. They got to be changed. And so, Father, use us. Everybody just lift your hands toward the Lord. Say, Lord, use me for your kingdom. Help me to be an accurate representation of, of a powerful Jesus. Lord, when people look at me and say, what is it in your life? You say, I am so glad you asked. It is nothing but the presence of Jesus Christ of Nazareth and his reality living in me. And if he'll live in me, he'll live in you too. And God, I thank you. Now, Lord, I pray that his capstone walks forward, that the power of the Holy Spirit will fall on this place. And Lord, that a constant flow of anointing would pour through this house and the people of this church. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that when people come on this campus next year and in the interim, even before next year, that there'll be such a presence among your people that everybody will fall under conviction and their eyes will be opened. And Lord, that... You will move in a powerful way that will bring glory to your holy name and be a reflection of your kingdom. I give you thanks, God. I give you glory. In the precious name of Jesus, for the glory of God, and everyone said amen. 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 Tino's going to come down, and he's going to bless you guys uh, with a blessing. We're going to have our prayer team down at the front. If you need prayer about anything after the service, come up, okay? Uh, if don't don't forget to go get your wristbands today as well, everybody. Let no church Wednesday. If you come here Wednesday, I won't be here. Uh, if you want to, you know, and the door won't even be open. So spend some time seeking God. If you don't, spend some time with the Lord. Talk to Him and enjoy your time with your family. Tino, thank you, brother. Would you stand up, stand. please? honor the Lord with his prayer. Uh, thank you, Pastor Parker, for that message, brother. Thank you. Thank you very much. Amen. The Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Shalom. Shalom.